Ahí está la pantalla. Francisco, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, good. How are you? We're doing great. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, webinar, uh, Bill. We're looking forward for your presentation. Let me introduce you as one of the uh, uh, thank you most, most important retinal people in, in the world uh, right now. I have been uh, president of Arbo, president of um, uh, the Macula Society. You have been awarded for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gas, Donald Gas uh, Award at the Macula Society. And also you have been teaching all year round for several years, uh, residents and fellows. And uh, this is what I like most of you that you are always teaching and provide us, uh, providing us uh, knowledge all the time. The moderator is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Andres Bastien from Buenos Aires, well-known okay. specialist. For Hi, how are you? Aires. Fine, thank you. So if you are ready to go. Ready. So can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. you can. Perfect. Okay. So uh, it, it's nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, you know, 45 minutes or so talking about the more common medications that can impact retinal function. There's a lot of interest right now, especially in the realm of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, whether or not it actually plays a role in the treatment of COVID. So we'll talk about that as well. I have no financial disclosures. So let's talk about medications. We're going to talk about different categories, how they impact the retina, whether it's pigmentary changes, macular edema, uh, crystalline maculopathy. But we're going to try to talk about uh, why this occurs, how it occurs, how we can limit the risk, and of course, treatment when applicable. So the biggest entity is that of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. And we know from a number of publications, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, I was part of a task force for the last 18 years. We had three publications most recently in 2016 talking about how to, or guidelines, how to use hydroxychloroquine, ideally less than five milligrams per kilogram per day. But we'll talk about this uh, briefly in, in a couple of minutes. Most importantly, not only is it the daily dose, but it's also the total cumulative dose that plays a role in terms of inducing toxicity. Once we see changes, these uh, slides show the bullseye changes, the changes seen angiographically and on fundus autofluorescence, those changes are unfortunately not reversible. And oftentimes they actually get worse as months and years go by. Mark Marmer has shown that even 10 years down the road after medication has been stopped, there can be worse progression. Sure. So another medication we'll talk about is that of uh, the phenothiazines, thyroidazine in particular, a much different pattern of pigmentary change. One sees this uh, so-called numular loss of chorio capillaris, and we'll talk about that very shortly. So even though this impacts the retinal pigment epithelium, it does it in a much different fashion than what we see with oxychloroquine. We'll also talk about didioxinosine, which has this peculiar pattern of sparing of the posterior pole but a mid-peripheral area of pigment atrophy. I'll show you multiple cases of these conditions and they all look very much alike. So these patterns are really quite unique. Most times, of course, we don't have a test to prove the diagnosis. These are all diagnosed based on pattern recognition. Other agents can cause vascular occlusion. Quinine, for example, when given in a high dose, uh, trying to induce an abortion or trying to commit suicide, can produce vascular occlusion, disc pallor, vascular attenuation, pigment modeling, Looking much like an old central retinal artery occlusion, this of course is also very uh, damaging to one's retina and it's hard to come back from a situation like this in terms of bringing back any visual function. Other things that cause vascular damage are things like uh, the, are ergot alkaloids, oral contraceptives, but in most patients who have problems with this, they have pre-existing other conditions like high blood pressure, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, high lipids, et cetera. For the most part, those medications are really quite safe. We'll talk briefly about a couple of other conditions that are induced by medication, procainamide, gentamicin given intravitrally can cause a vascular occlusion. We rarely use this today, so it's, it's been quite a few years since I've induced a problem like this. More recently, we've seen obliterative vasculitis with intracameral vancomycin, producing this so-called red man syndrome, hemorrhages, vascular occlusion, which can be very visually devastating. And more recently, there's been this issue with intravitreal borlicizumab. Uh, what causes this particular retinal arterial occlusion, much like we saw with vancomycin, is not entirely clear. There are 13 cases reported to the ASRS. Uh, most of these patients had had previous treatment with other drugs, but why this occurred, not entirely known. 
And of course, the investigation is ongoing. In general, a very safe medication, but just recognize there have been these, this little cluster of cases reported with brolicizumab. Other agents that cause vascular damage, interferon, and the chemotherapeutics. When we finish up this talk toward the end, we'll talk about the newer chemotherapeutics, such as the MEK inhibitors, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and uh, we'll talk about what we see in those conditions. Also, we'll talk briefly about uh, agents that cause macular edema, nicotinic acid. The diuretics can induce a, a, a idiosyncratic response where sulfa-containing medications like diuretics and some antibiotics can lead to retinal edema, folds, and even angle closure glaucoma. So we'll talk about this issue very shortly once again. The agent that we encounter most commonly in the States is topiramate, a treatment of uh, or preventive treatment for migraine headaches, which can induce this uh, idiosyncratic response of retinal edema, thickening of the choroid, inducement of angle closure, and once that's identified and resolved, most patients do very well. Crystals are really quite fascinating. We'll talk briefly about tamoxifen, which is a treatment for a metastatic breast carcinoma. Anthoxanthine, of course, is more of a food coloring additive. Methoxyfluorine, an agent that used to be used in inducement of anesthesia, used very infrequently, and of course, talc is more a contaminant of intravenous and intraarterial drug abuse. Uveitis, a couple of rare things, rifibutin, atypical mycobacterium infections, cidofavir, uh, some of the viral infections used very rarely today, but they can induce not only profound uveitis, but also hypotony, which can lead to loss of visual function. And finally, we really won't talk about this today, but this will be in the references I'll give you toward the end. Uh, Sildenafil, of course, Viagra can produce a potentially a non-arteritic cancer ischemic optic neuropathy. This has not yet been fully proven. As I mentioned earlier, we'll talk about the chemotherapeutics at the end, particularly the MEK inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitors, and what's called the ALK or ALK inhibitors as well. A lot of information forthcoming in these agents. They are saving lives, but obviously inducing quite a few systemic manifestations as well as ocular problems as well. Let's talk about things. We'll talk about the seven or eight most common entities, hydroxychloroquine, once again, the most commonly encountered problem that you're gonna see in your clinic does not cross the blood retinal barrier as readily as chloroquine, but yet we can still see this very typical bullseye type change. Used typically today for rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, some dermatologic disorders, and recognize that it has relatively few side effects other than the issue pertaining to the maculopathy that we just showed you. We'll talk about more over the next few minutes. This question of COVID, is this really a viable treatment? And we'll come back to this later as well. We know that uh, hydroxychloroquine actually can inhibit viral RNA replication, can inhibit some of the growth of the COVID virus. Is it effective? We don't really know yet. There are some anecdotal reports that suggest a possible benefit. Is it safe? For the most part, yes, but it's used at a higher dose than we use typically for treatment of lupus and or arthritis. We published a paper last week, a re reference down here at the bottom, Point out that uh, problems have arisen. And if you look at the reports in the literature, recognize that just last week there were eight deaths attributed to chloroquine in the trial of COVID in Brazil. So it's certainly not necessarily safe. And is it effective? That certainly is not yet known. So what do we see with the hydroxychloroquine? Once again, the typical bullseye type lesion. Most times patients are kept at less than five milligrams per kilogram per day. And usually it takes about uh, in excess of five years to see a change like this. Here's that same patient, typical bullseye lesion, highlighted quite nicely with a fluorescent angiogram, vision of 2070 and 2080 respectively. But here's an example, as I mentioned earlier, this medication is actually stored inside the eye. Here's a patient back in 1992, no evidence of uh, macular abnormalities on hydroxychloroquine. By 1999, some bullseye changes started to occur Medication was stopped. There was no more exposure, but look what happened over the next five or six years, rather profound advancements into a full-fledged uh, full bullseye, bullseye lesion and worsening in the right eye as well. So once again, this binds to melanin, is stored in the eye, can get worse months and years after discontinuation of the medication. So if we see evidence of change, we recommend very strongly to our rheumatologist to stop the medication right away. How do we monitor? Well, it's a multimodal approach. I think most of us probably rely mainly on SDOCT, but as Mike Marmer has pointed out, uh, it's really a combination of photographs, OCT, fundus autofluorescence, hump visual fields, and when the later stages of the disease occur, the multifocal ERG as well. 
uh, but all of these can play a role in determining early features of toxicity. A couple of cases. A patient on the standard dose, 400 milligrams per day, some very mild bullseye type, type changes seen quite nicely on the angiogram. Fundus autofluorescence shows a beautiful pattern of the pigment alteration. There is some mild central macular thinning and some pericentral thinning as well. This patient actually was of Asian descent and typically those patients will have more of a pericentral pattern compared to a central area of atrophy. Visual field was markedly abnormal, uh, pericentral scotomas in both eyes. And when you see changes on the visual field, take that very seriously because this is a very reliable test for determination of toxicity. The multifocal ERG was impaired, but not terribly so, but that patient once again had evidence of toxicity. Another example, a patient on 20 years of medication, rather typically seen bullseye type change here, changes on fundus autofluorescence. They get worse with time. You see more stippled hyper autofluorescence. And this patient has what's called the very classic macular lesion out of the so-called flying saucer sign elevation of the ellipsoid layer because of thinning adjacent to that. This becomes bowed anteriorly as a very recognizable feature of hydroxychloroquine maculopathy seen here very nicely. Once again, the so-called flying saucer sign. Just an example, once again, flying saucer seen on OCT, progressive pigmentary changes occur over time, even after medication has been discontinued. So recognize that if you have a patient that has any of these features, whether it's macular pigment modeling, a bullseye change, the flying saucer sign and OCT, that medication should be stopped because this can get worse. Example one scanner is showing the changes in fundus autofluorescence, worsening as time goes by. So once again, these are all features of uh, abnormality. Different patterns are seen, kind of a normal fundus autofluorescence, some mild uh, model hyperfluorescence, more of a full scale area of change. So recognize these are all abnormalities that can be attributed to the use of hydroxychloroquine. And finally, one more case, bad news, 40 milligrams a day for 35 years, disc pattern, vascular attenuation, profound pigmentary change, vasculitis. This was a patient that should have been off the medication many, many years ago. Problem sometimes is that these patients are put on medication by the rheumatologist, they're doing well. They kind of forget the fact they've been on the medication for a long time. And before you know it, they have very profound changes. This patient has almost a complete thickness of flying saucer sign in both eyes. Amazingly, the vision was reasonable at 2070 and 2080. We stopped the medication, of course. The patient's been stable the last couple of years, but this should have never happened because the medication was used far too long. The patient had an abnormal ERG, a very suppressed multifocal ERG. Once again, certain features that should have been documented much sooner and medication should have been stopped a long time earlier. So, the first guidelines were published by the Academy back in 2002. Mike Marmer, lead author, myself and others as part of that group. Back then, of course, a lot of our imaging techniques were quite rudimentary. OCT was becoming quite common. But today, of course, we have much better modalities. So I'm going to talk about briefly later what is new in the 2016 guidelines. How does toxicity occur? Not fully known, but it does bind the, the medication does bind the melanin, stays in the eye probably disrupts the photoreceptor metabolism and leads to the loss of pigmentation and atrophic changes. Light may play a role. And even in some cases, there may be some issue pertaining to uh, hereditary uh, propensity as well. No one debates the potential for visual impairment. By five years, if a patient is on the standard dose of less than five milligrams per kilogram per day, risk is roughly 2% of toxicity, but by 20 years, up to 20%. In other papers, uh, Ron Mellis reported roughly a 7.5% risk of toxicity, but once again, relatively limited, only 1% or 2% in the first 10 years. So once again, not only is it the daily dose of less than 5 milligrams per kilogram per day, but patients who are on medication for a number of years, you know, 5 years, 10 years, the risks become much greater the longer the patient is exposed to the medication. These are some of the cumulative risk factors. Once again, at the bottom here, duration, cumulative dose, daily dose, Recognize this is cleared by the kidneys, therefore renal disease can exacerbate and lead to a higher level of medication in the bloodstream. Reason is not entirely clear, but tamoxifen seems to exacerbate this tremendously. So if a patient happens to be on tamoxifen, they should really have this medication curtailed if at all possible because the two agents seem to have a very negative interaction. So once again, keep patients on less than five milligrams per kilogram per day and recognize if there are concurrent 
uh, ex existing diseases such as renal disease that the patient should be monitored even more carefully. So cleared by the liver, cleared by the kidneys, predisposition, I think that you kind of get the picture here. Even pre-existing maculopathy may lead to a greater role of toxicity. So if there happens to be other macular changes, you have to be leery that this may cause a more rapid worsening. What tests do we get for screening? This is you know, published in our 2016 paper, but we tend to get baseline um, color photographs, a visual field, 10-2, SDOCT, and usually get fundus autofluorescence. Since the risk of toxicity is so low in that first five years, we tend to recommend just a annual examination until the five-year time frame, or until, of course, the patient has some evidence of change as they report back to you. As I mentioned earlier, which one test is most reliable? And it's really a spectrum of the tests. Um, you'll see cases where there's a normal OCT, yet changes seen on multifocal ERG. Perimetry can be very sensitive, but it's not uniformly available. But you really have to kind of put this into the spectrum of all these tests that can play a role in picking up early features of toxicity. Once again, just looking here at the typical of OCT that we see, fundus autofluorescence, multifocal ERG is all advisable. Multifocal ERG for the most part is not employed until after five years or until a patient has some distinct symptoms of paracentral visual loss. We published a couple of papers on microperimetry. Can be very sensitive, but it's not commercially available and not highly reproducible. Therefore, it's not really employed as a routine screening test. Test not recommended, amateur grid, not really useful. Angiography, not really useful. Color vision, not specific enough. And a full field ERG just does not pick up early changes at an early enough time frame. So really don't bother doing these tests in terms of screening type tools. So toxicity, once again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if it starts to occur, uh, it's not going to you know, get better. It only has the potential to get worse. So take this very seriously. When I see a patient like this in clinic, I contact the rheumatologist via phone conversation right then and there. We advise them on the features, try to get them to stop the medication. Even cutting back the medication is not really adequate. For the most part, it really should be stopped when signs of toxicity occur. So bottom line is, I think you're all well aware of this uh, medication. And I'm sorry, I backed up a little bit, sorry. From our 2016 guidelines, the classic bullseye is the most common. Toxicity is pretty rare early on. Keep it less than five milligrams per kilogram per day. Watch out for concurrent tamoxifen. Watch out for concurrent renal disease. If they have evidence of changes, make sure you stop the medication. So kind of coming back full circle to the COVID question. In the studies that have been done thus far, once again, not controlled clinical trials, Medication has been used at a higher dose, up to 600 milligrams per day rather than 200 to 400 milligrams. Short term, usually only a couple of weeks. The risk of toxicity is probably very low, if at all, yet there have been deaths with chloroquine. And also keep in mind that a published paper back in 2015 showed toxicity occurred very early when hydroxychloroquine was implied in a cancer treatment trial. So if someone comes to me and they ask, could my patient be on hydroxychloroquine if they're COVID positive? I say there's not enough data to really make that recommendation in spite of what our President Trump may say to the contrary. That pretty much wraps up hydroxychloroquine. Let's talk about another agent that produces pigmentary change, that's thyridazine. Now of all of the phenothiazines, this is far and away the most toxic. Retinopathy reported back in 1960. This is also dose and duration dependent, but much, much different than what we saw with hydroxychloroquine. This produces this diffuse pigmentary change Starts off with some mild pigment modeling and clumping. This can get worse. Go on to a salt and pepper pattern pigmentary change, as you see here, highlighted angiographically as a very classic salt and pepper pattern. Vision here, of course, was still quite well preserved and good, but it can get worse. You get this numular pigmentary change, clumping, loss of pigment, highlighted angiographically once again, in this case with vision now of 2200 due to the loss of macular pigmentation more of a wide angle view, but still showing this beautiful numular pattern of pigmentary loss. And then it can get worse, this clumping, loss of RP and chorio capillaries, both this patient now hand motion. Recognize a lot of these patients who are coming in on the antipsychotic medications aren't the best historians. Yeah. Oftentimes they experience profound visual loss before they have a chance to really communicate the fact that they are not seeing well. But the very typical pattern, this numular Focal areas that loss of pigment, not only in the macular region, but throughout the entire posterior fold and periphery. All these patients look very similar, much, much different than hydroxychloroquine. 
but this numular pattern of loss, this can get even worse. You look like retinitis pigmentosa. Here's a patient with profound, complete loss of pigmentation, disc pallor, vascular attenuation. All you see are pretty much are the underlying uh, choroidal vessels deep under the retina. So generally when used up to 800 milligrams per day, it's quite safe. In excess of a gram can be toxic. So the therapeutic to toxic dose range is really quite close. And recognize these patients are not great historians, which makes it even a bit more troubling to monitor these types of patients. Similar to hydroxychloroquine, the minimum daily dose is more critical than the total cumulative dose, but they both can play a role leading to uh, features of toxicity. How does this occur? Not entirely known, but this medication, in contrast to the other phenothiazines, contains a papyrtal side chain, probably produces retinal enzyme inhibition, leads to toxicity. If you go back in the literature 50 years ago, there's a medication called NP207, structurally very similar to thyroidazine, was so toxic it never made it into the market. But this medication, once again, of all the phenothiazines, certainly has the most potential for toxicity. And similar to hydroxychloroquine, this medication actually binds to melanin and therefore stays in the eye on an indefinite basis. This pathologically, a loss of the outer retina, replacement of the uh, outer rod segments, lipofuscin, and pigment atrophy leading to loss of visual function. In terms of monitoring, for the most part, uh, electrophysiology is just uh, too, too late. You should just monitor these patients clinically, see them every six months. If there's features of pigmentary change, recommend to you the treating psychiatrist or internist to stop the medication. Okay, another agent that produces pigmentary change is that of didioxinacin or DDI for short. This actually is a mitochondrial inhibitor that can produce rather extensive mid peripheral pigmentary changes. Spares the post to your pole, and once again, as you'll see here shortly, a very typical presentation. All these patients look pretty much alike. Mid peripheral pigmentary change, areas of hypertrophy and atrophy, macular sparing, good central vision, but constriction of the peripheral visual field. Looks very much like other conditions that are known as um, mid but uh, maternally inherited diabetes mellitus, MELOS, uh, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like syndrome. I'll show pictures of those conditions look identical to you what's induced by didioxinacine. Here's a typical picture. Staring in the posterior pole, mid-peripheral pigment modeling in a beautiful circinate circular fashion. Vision in these eyes, 20-25 or 20-30, but markedly constricted peripheral visual fields. These pictures all look alike all patients with DDI toxicity. This can be progressive, 2001, 2006. The pigmentary changes become more pronounced in the periphery. They become more clumped in the periphery, but still this patient was 20, 25, and 20, 30. No, no additional medication, still good vision nine years later, but look at the profound pigmentary disturbance in the, in the periphery with sparing of the posterior pole. So it's a very intriguing agent, um, mitochondrial inhibitor, uh, but precisely why this happens, not entirely clear, but all these patients look almost identical. I've got about five different patients here that have this medication toxicity, and they all look the same. So just recognize that in contrast to hydroxychloroquine, which produces a macular change, in contrast to thyroidism, which produces a numular change, this produces a peripheral change distinctly different than those other entities. So once again, very similar to mid and MELOS, and here's a case of, of the maternally inherited diabetes mellitus looking identical. Here's a patient with uh, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acid syndrome, and stroke-like syndrome, identical appearance to patients with DDI. So it's, it's an agent that uh, is rather profound uh, pigmentary change, but in the periphery, no test to prove a diagnosis, but just a pattern recognition. And finally, one more entity in the realm of pigmentary change, that's pentacin polysulfate. Another pattern of pigmentary change, this occurs in the treatment of interstitial cystitis, uh, bladder discomfort, noted only in females. This stippled, mottled macular pigmentary change misdiagnosed for many years as a precursor to AMD, perhaps a, uh, a macular uh, you know, dystrophy, et cetera, but these all look alike. They all have this mottled pigmentation seen beautifully on fundus autofluorescence. So patients generally have quite good vision pigment modeling, excrescence is seen on Brooks membrane. We now know with a couple of studies that have longitudinal follow-up that these areas can evolve into atrophy and lead to vision loss. This medication was approved in the United States back in 1996 for interstitial cystitis. It coats and protects bladder epithelium 
used by females for regional pelvic pain and uh, millions of patients on this medication and introduced back in 1996. But the first sign of toxicity wasn't until 2016. And most patients have to be on this medication for at least 12 years or so before features of this uh, toxicity occur. But once again, identical appearance here, stippled model pigmentary changes involving the macular region, does not involve the periphery, but these all look very much alike. OCT may show some excrescences at Brooks membrane, but for the most part, not excessive thinning per se, uh, just the changes seen on uh, OCT, and perhaps a little bit of a vascular abnormality noted on OCTA as well. So differential diagnosis, far and away pattern dystrophy, early AMD, some of the mitochondrial disorders, but this is pentacin polysulfate, recognized now quite readily, publications since 2016. But these patients pretty much all look alike. These are the six patients from a study by Pierce, identical appearance, that stippled model pigmentary change in the posterior pole. Common features, elderly patients, all female, all similar pigmentary changes, and all of them had been on medication for at least 14 years, a cumulative dose, 2,000 plus grams. But their vision was really quite good, generally 2025 or 2030. I recognize Dave Seraph has now published a paper that'll appear shortly in the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology, which shows that some of these stippled pigmentary changes can go on to geographic atrophy. So if a patient is seen on this medication, has macular pigmentary change, talk to the urologist, internist, have them get off this medication as soon as possible because this can lead to long-term visual loss. So bottom line, take a careful history, receive macular pigment modeling, female patient, ask the question, do they take pent pentacin polysulfate? Be amazed that I picked up probably three patients in my clinic for the past three years that have been on this medication. I didn't recognize it until we became aware of this entity, something that is in your clinic most likely, assuming this medication, of course, is available in your country, which I presume it probably is. Okay, we're gonna move on now to agents that cause macular and or retinal edema. Uh, the highlight of this course are medications like oral contraceptives, most patients, though, have coexisting uh, vascular disease like high blood pressure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Thon gas, of course, described this issue of nictinic acid, a non-leaking form of cystoid edema. Some of the glitazones can cause edema. There's drug-induced myopia, and the taxols can produce edema in the treatment of various forms of cancer. Here's an example of a patient with drug-induced myopia. Not much to see except some very fine macular striae. This patient had an altered refractive status, most times the refraction becomes a bit more hyperopic. This patient was on a sulfa-containing diuretic. And you see here on the left-hand picture, some striae medication was identified, stopped, and the striae disappear. The refraction status went back to normal, vision returned to normal. So it's something that occurs infrequently. But once again, if, you, if a patient comes in with a change in refractive status, you see retinal folds. Think of the possibility of theosyncratic sulfa-containing medication as possibly causing this. One thing that we'll see most commonly in the States are with topiramate, Topamax, treatment and prevention of migraine headaches. You see here this congested choroid beneath the retina. Retina itself looks pretty good, but there's a lot of congestion and edema in the choroid. This patient's medication was identified and stopped. Things cleared up, but this patient ended up with some rather stippled pigment out temporarily, but the edema went away and the patient did well. Occasionally, the patient will come in an angle closure. You get so much thickening of the choroid, this can lead to an anterior displacement of the lens iris diaphragm. Angle closure can occur. We probably have a couple or three times a year, the residents are called the emergency department for angle closure, and it's because they've been placed on this medication and they have the lens iris diaphragm. Here you'll see a picture of a very thickened retinochoidal layer, which led to this angle closure in this patient. Medication was stopped. Patient was treated medically, did well, and of course, not exposed again to Topamax medication. So patients do well, identify the problem, find out what medication they're on. In this case, Topamax, like I say, is probably one of the more common things that we see in terms of inducement of uh, refractive change and angle closure in our clinics here in the States. So once again, exactly what happens, not entirely clear. Why does the ciliary body react? Why do you get swelling? Um, Idiosyncratic is the best explanation, but uh, exactly you know, why this happens, no one really knows. But just to identify the problem, treat it, stop medication, patients can do very well. A brief word about some crystals, uh, one of my favorite categories. Uh, this was a patient on tamoxifen or Nalvidex. It's an agent used in the treatment of uh, 
metastatic breast carcinoma. These patients have uh, positive estrogen receptors, not the most common medication today for treatment of uh, metastatic uh, breast carcinoma, but still we see it quite a bit. Uh, these patients in years past were treated with medication up to 60 to 100 milligrams. Today, it's only 10 to 20 milligrams per day. There's only about a 3% chance of reducing And for the most part, these crystals are visually asymptomatic. Now you have to make a decision here when you see a patient like this, they have some crystals. It's not really impairing their vision. We treated for a life-threatening process. Most times I'll contact the oncologist. I'll say the patient you know, the features of change, uh, but usually we let the medication continue and the patients tend to do quite well in spite of the crystals that we see clinically. Now we also see this used in the treatment of metastatic glioblastoma. I mentioned earlier when this medication came out about 30 years ago, it was used at a higher dose for breast carcinoma today at 20 milligrams. But when we see patients with uh, glioblastoma, sometimes around 200 milligrams twice a day, very common. But these patients, of course, are very sick, have a life-threatening process. Oftentimes we'll see some concurrent edema. We'll treat the edema, let them stay on the medication. Sometimes crystals occur outside the realm of the posterior pole as well. Bottom line is that these patients are going to treat with one of the anti-VEGF agents. 2070, 2080 vision back to 2020. You see pre-treatment, pre there's crystals, there's edema. The edema goes away. Crystals, of course, don't change. Pre and post-treatment, once again, with a Vastin. Pre and post with a Vastin. Pre and post, crystals stay. The edema goes away. Patients are happy. No leakage angiographically, but there's some modeled uh, hyperfluorescence, of course. And the bottom line is that these patients can do very well. Here's an older OCT, of course, but big time edema and nice resolution of that with a Vastin. So it's a problem you, you won't see real commonly. It's used for metastatic breast carcinoma, occasional treatment of glioblastoma, uh, but it can induce crystals. For the most part, they do not hurt the vision, but if there's concurrent edema, of course, treat that. Patients are generally quite happy. That way they have re, you know, reasonable vision. And usually, unfortunately, especially with glioblastoma, their lifespan is quite short uh, on that, with that condition. What happens hist histopathologically, there are crystals that occur in the uh, nerve fiber layer, interplexiform layer, the composition not entirely known, presumably, it's presumably direct deposit of the medication right into the retina. That has not yet been fully proven. How do we treat one scan? For the most part, we leave them on the medication because usually it's essential and long-term visual impairment for the most part is not a big concern. So tamoxifen, one of the more common things that produce crystals. I won't talk about the other agents, but I wanna wrap this up in the last uh, oh, 10 minutes or so. So we have some questions. With uh, chemotherapeutics, what's new in this realm? This is really exploding as far as uh, new associations. Let's talk a bit about some of the earlier things. The taxols can produce edema. Uh, I would see a number of patients in the clinic with edema of uncertain etiology. You take a careful history. They're taking some of the taxols for treatment of metastatic conditions. You generally can't stop the medication. We treat those with anti-vegetative therapy. They tend to get better. But we're going to spend most of our time talking about the MEC checkpoint and ELK inhibitors. So MEC inhibitors, what are they? Uh, Mutagen activated protein kinase inhibitors. Uh, some of the agents listed on my slide here. This can lead to a central serous like form of retinopathy. It looks just like central serous and or a pigment up tube attachment, but there's no leakage. And the even better news is that uh, all those can produce changes in one's retina for the most part, it goes away with time. And oftentimes, even with continuation of the medication, it actually gets better on its own. Typical example, here's a patient with multiple, what looks like little PED type lesions. You see the PED here, doesn't leak angiographically. If it's outside the fovea, of course, you just watch and monitor. If it's in the fovea, that might be an indication to stop the medication, if at all possible. But for the most part, we let them stay on the medication. Here's a patient we've been following for the last 11 years, melanoma in the left eye. Brachytherapy was employed. The patient did well for about seven years and then came in with complications. I, I did about three years, I'm sorry. Came in then with uh, metastatic disease, was put on a MEK inhibitor. And now the treatment, of course, was in the left eye, but let's look at these little PED-like lesions here in the right eye. Angiographically, no leakage, yet there are these little PEDs, in this case, right in the macula. So now you have a patient with impaired visual function, left eye, systemic metastatic disease, now with visual impairment in the right eye, what do you do? Explain to the patient that uh, we'd recommend keeping them on the medication because it was needed. 
Uh, these actually got better with time and the patient did okay, but unfortunately succumbed to the metastatic disease after about uh, 18 months. So MEK inhibitors can lead to serious detachments and or features that look like picking up through detachments, but they do not leak angiographically. Natural history for the most part is quite reasonably good. Let's go on to the checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, these are very fascinating agents that have led to a multitude of patients doing well with systemic metastatic disease. There's three different uh, definitions, program death proteins, the PD-1s, program death ligands, the PD-L1s, and the cytotoxic T-lymphocyte antigen 4s, the CTLA-4s, different medications all in the same realm of so-called checkpoint inhibitors. Let's talk about pembrolizumab, Keytruda, one of the more common medications that we see here in the States at least. This has gone through a number of trials for a variety of systemic metastatic diseases not only in the realm of cancers, but also some of the infectious papilloma type uh, issues given intravenously, usually requires three treatments. Now, when a person has a normal immune response, the T cells, of course, are activated. They attack, destroy tumor cells. When the tumor process takes over, that's when things get out of control. But these medications allow the T cells to once again function more normally and deactivate the tumor cells. And so when this medication works, it can be wonderful. And oftentimes patients do incredibly well, but sometimes they just don't respond. And so trying to determine who's going to respond, who's not, is really not possible. But this medication, the type of medication is used very commonly today for a variety of metastatic disease processes. And a number of those are listed right here. And these are, of course, are all uh, these indications for k for all these processes are in place already. And the list goes pretty much on a monthly basis. Now, what do we see from the ocular standpoint? First of all, the good news is we only see complications in about 1% of patients related to inflammation, exudation, parotis like pictures that occur with this type of medication. Here you see this uh, swollen posterior pole, macular striae, swelling, which looks a lot like parotis disease, a wider angle view, angiographically, little pin foci of hyperfluorescence almost in a so-called starry sky type pattern, very typical for a herodos like picture, induced by these checkpoint inhibitors. Now, once again, you've got a patient with a life-threatening process. Um, they've now got systemic and ocular complications. What do you do? Well, the good news is that most times this responds very nicely to topical and or systemic corticosteroid therapy. So you, you can keep the patient on the medication and most times they do quite well with steroids. Macular edema, very common. A uh, nice paper published by the Shields Group about two years ago on the checkpoint inhibitors, immune therapy. This is still, you know, quite current. I recognize, of course, new agents come along pretty much every year and new indications occur as well. These are the common systemic features. Common, more than 30% of patients experience anemia, fatigue, etc. Less common, a big list of uh, complications as well. But the bottom line is that if the patient is responding to these medications and the tumors are becoming better controlled for the most part, even though this can be quite problematic, patients are quite willing to stay on the medication. Now, what happens from the ocular standpoint? Pretty much any part of the eye can be involved, conjunctivitis, ptosis, dry eye, uveitis, myopathy, inflammatory orbitopathy, optic neuropathy, choroidopathy, retinopathy, but for the most part, the most common features are that of ocular inflammatory changes, parotid like picture, exudes retinal detachment, macular edema. And once again, the good news is it responds quite nicely to corticosteroid therapy. Overall, roughly 1% of patients uh, have an ocular complication related to this immune process. So it's a pretty well tolerated medication from the ocular standpoint. When do the changes occur? Anytime really from a matter of a few weeks after initiation of the medication, Two months later, uh, I get called by our oncology team to look at a, a variety of these patients in the clinic, oftentimes occurring within a month of initiation of therapy. If it's being used for an experimental protocol, the medication has to be stopped, which is really unfortunate because we know this does respond quite nicely to systemic corticosteroids. If the patient is on a proven indication, then of course we can continue the medication, treat them with steroids, and oftentimes they do quite well. Something that you'll see more commonly, especially if you have any type of a oncology practice in your clinic, manage this with topical and or systemic corticosteroids. And treatment can be discontinued or delayed. You were talking about the checkpoint inhibitors for the most part that we try to keep them on the medication because of their life-threatening you know, indication for the use of the medication.
This actually goes back to 2012. The first report was uh, this paper here by Wong uh, showing a VKH-like process on one of the early checkpoint inhibitors. Very typical presentation once again, a starry sky type pattern seen angiographically, pinpoint foci of leakage, responded beautifully to systemic corticosteroids, resolved very nicely after a week of prednisone, restoration of vision, the patient did well from the standpoint of containment of their ocular findings. This case did not do well from the standpoint of systemic disease, but at least the patient did have some reasonable visual function in the last uh, months of their life. OCT is uh, still a little bit of flu, but for the most part, you know, did very well. And finally, a brief word about the ALK inhibitors. What are they? Anaplastic lymphoma kinase inhibitors, including the agents that's listed on the slide. These are employed primarily in the treatment of a non-small cell lung carcinoma, so-called NSCLC, diffusion gene, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, and anaplastic large cell lymphomas. So very rarely encountered, but we've seen a couple of patients. Now, do you see typical features clinically? Not exactly. What you see are patients complaining about photopsias, post-flash bulb effects, light training from moving objects, Occasionally some macular edema, but for the most part, it's more symptomatology of altered light perception, photopsias, flash bulb effects. You can make the diagnosis with, with a variety of uh, tests, most commonly with an electroretinogram. Is that crucial? No, you really can't do anything. So for the most part, we'll document the most likely diagnosis based on the factor on one of these medications and basically monitor the patient. So these are uh, an, a group of agents that are seen, you know, fairly infrequently today, but just recognize this concept of what's called an ELK inhibitor. So MEK inhibitors, check one inhibitors, ELK inhibitors, seen much more commonly, especially as uh, time goes by. So in summary, there's thousands of medications out there on the market. Relatively few cause retinal complications, broken down into various categories, agents that produce patterns of change, Pigmentary changes, we talked about hydroxychloroquine, the bullseye lesion, we talked about thyroidazine, where we diffuse numular pigmentary change, DDI causing a mid peripheral change, and pentacin causing that macular stipple model pigmentary change. Other agents can cause macular edema, idiosyncratic responses to induce retinal stria, crystalline changes can occur. And then there's some other agents, of course, the uh, uh, chemotherapeutics, which lead to a whole array of complications ranging from the MEK inhibitors to the checkpoint inhibitors to the ELK inhibitors as well. So be aware, make sure you understand, of course, what medications the patient is taking. Uh, that's going to help you establish the diagnosis. Now, from a reference standpoint, the most recent uh, publication by our group uh, on behalf of the American Academy of Ophthalmology 2016 we published the first report in 2002, followed by 2011, followed by 2016. You might say we're due for round number four. Probably will happen. Um, what's happening now, of course, there are features. There's better OCT. There's web source OCT. There's OCTA. And, of course, what you want to find are the earliest reproducible features of change so you can stop the medication before toxicity occurs. So watch probably another year down, down the road. We may have an updated uh, report in terms of recommendations for screening. I recognize this is for screening. This is not for treatment because once the features are seen, it's already a bit too late because they're not reversible. They can progress even 10 years down the road. A paper by Mike Marmer just recently in 2018 uh, showed patients 10 years after medication was stopped with worsening of their features. We've also been uh, fortunate to produce a number of book chapters. Uh, they're the new Orion textbooks will be coming out later this year. Um, hopefully at time for the academy, if the academy happens in person, which we hope it does. Uh, one of my residents, a couple of our previous fellows have contributed in the past, but the new edition will contain everything I just talked about, MEK inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitors, health inhibitors, everything else, pentosin, et cetera. Look for that in the 2020, probably 21 will be the, the publication date in Ryan. Two years ago, we published the Retina Atlas. Uh, we're gonna start working on the third edition coming forth probably for 2022. Uh, which will contain, you know, some of the newer images, which I showed you tonight. Other books have our chapters in uh, Essentials of Vitreretinal Disease, uh, Imaging and Systemic Diseases, Curbside Consultations, uh, and this paper that we just published uh, last week on the Clark and Dr. Clark and Toxicity, Consideration and Treatment of COVID-19, which again, wouldn't recommend it per se. Uh, it's short-lived. It's a, a brief exposure. It's a higher dose. But unless it's really effective, I see no reason to put the patient on this medication. Hopefully we'll have a time frame where we'll have a controlled clinical trial that may show a benefit. 
There's another medication not related to this called remdesivir, which was used for Ebola therapy. Uh, it was great in the laboratory, didn't help clinically against Ebola. Remdesivir is being employed now against COVID, even here in Chicago. Uh, some of the anecdotal reports say it's wonderful. I'm going to wait and see what happens there as well. But just uh, once again, kind of summarizing, make sure you understand what, what medications your patients are on. Now, if you have a patient on medication and you think it may be related, check out this website, idrugregistry.com. This is not a peer-reviewed publication. This is something where anecdotal reports, for example, you may see a patient and you think may have a feature from a medication Take a, take, take a look at this website. You may encounter other people who have seen similar features. You may end up you know, leading to some recognition of a pattern like Pentacin was discovered about four years ago. But it's a good website to look at and be aware of in terms of looking for anecdotal evidence of perhaps some similar features other people may have seen uh, as well. That pretty much wraps up the overview of medications. I think we finished about uh, 45 minutes here, Francisco. Uh, yes. It's pretty yeah. overwhelming, but uh, you know, take a look at the chapter in Ryan. It's it's really a great overview. You can kind of read that at your leisure. But I think we pretty much covered the most commonly encountered medication that you might see in your practice. Questions? Bill, thank you very much for this thank you. wonderful presentation. And I now yes. uh, give the mic to uh, Andres. Yes, thank you, questions. Dr. <laughs> Bill. Amazing presentation. You have a great experience for a long period of time. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, no, no sé si, si alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta. Uh, one of the questions uh, you have answered uh, about the end phase OCT. So no. do, you, do you think that uh, we don't have an advantage to use in the, the first time of the, the uh, adroxychloroquine administration in order to prevent the, the toxicity, no? Well, once again, I think it's one of those imaging modalities that we are suspicious for some features that probably will, will prove to be uh, reliable. But as of right now, it's not something that's routinely available in a lot of clinics. And so that's why you've not addressed this in terms of a routine screening type tool. But I think we okay. we'll probably add that to the list of uh, yeah. uh, you know, things to, to use in, in the screening process, but just not quite yeah. yet. Uh, what, what is your recommendation to, to follow up the patients in this uh, pandemic situation when you uh, normally know that the 800 milligrams per day, the, the patients are, are treated? So uh, when, when the, the people is okay, what, what is the, the, the recommendation? Because you, you talk about the time, this is a very important right. thing, but now we have several patients with high doses in short time. So what is your recommendation about the, 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 the follow-up of, of this patient? Yeah, if you take a look at the paper that we wrote for the Asia Pacific yeah. technology that I referenced uh, just last week, uh, we suggested if possible to have someone look at the macula before they put on the medication. Now that's not too likely. First of all, not too many ophthalmologists want to get involved in that patient's care because of the exposure to themselves. Um, Ideally, that is recommended. In reality, probably not going to happen. Uh, if the patient reports any visual loss, of course, then the patient needs to be seen. We would recommend probably like a one-month follow-up after they're off the medication. But the risk of having toxicity, unless they have a toxic condition, is really, fortunately, very rare. But most trials, the patients put on about one and a half to two times the recommended dose for treatment of lupus and or arthritis. But it's a very short exposure, usually 10 to 14 days. Yeah, okay. Okay. Francisco, do you want yeah, to, to make a question? No, it's a common, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a report that is, was published yesterday by the New England Journal of Medicine that the, the patients that were on, on hydroxychloroquine is a uh, report from the Wayne State University. Patients uh, that were on hydroxychloroquine were most likely to need uh, uh, respiratory support, yeah, uh, well, compared to patients that were not on hydroxychloroquine. So. Yeah, but, but once again, Francisco, that's anecdotal. Yeah. I mean, the problem yeah. is that we just don't have proof of that. Um, it's, it's like the trial on the other side of the city here in Chicago, remdesivir, remdesivir. You know, the reports are going all did great. They come off their uh, um, uh, hyperventilate, they're off their uh, respiratory support. But I need to see some data. And it's just yeah. uh, mm -hmm. skeptical, unfortunately. 
Um, but yeah, hopefully it's helping patients. I just can't really quote you any trial the data from France that was felt to be beneficial. Follow-up was uh, not obtained in many patients. A lot of patients lost the follow-up and you just have to be very careful what you read. So I, I just don't put much emphasis on accepting that quite yet. All right. All right. Okay, normally, uh, Bill, in your experience with the macular edema following drug toxicity, uh, needs for any treatment, uh, improves when you stop using the drug or you need to, to treat? Or de it depends on the, the drug. For example, as, as you mentioned, the glitazones. Yeah. Yeah, most times it depends upon the drug. Um, I mean, some of the things like the uh, glitazones, the uh, taxols, the patient can't really come off the medication and we treat them and they do pretty well with treatment. If you can stop the medication, probably it would get better with time. I've encountered some patients that have had on the taxols, for example, had the edema for quite some time and they developed atrophy. And then of course, even when the edema goes away, they still don't recover the vision. So it really depends upon uh, each individual agent and how needed the medication. medication. But there, there's no set answer per se. Okay. Okay. The, the, there is a, a difficult situation with glitazones because, as we know, uh, the, the patients are treated with glit. Sería bueno que apaguen los micrófonos, chicos. The patients are diabetic. They have insulin treatment, and the glitazones improve the, 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 the uh, insulin. Uh, sometimes you mix the edema, the, the, the systole edema uh, is mixed with the diabetic edema. What is your recommendation to differentiate it? Because sometimes it's, it's impossible to know exactly if it's toxicity or is improve of the edema uh, for the diabetes. Yeah, that, that's a tough one there. I mean, I think what I would do is that if, uh, I would probably treat it. Um, yeah. The fact you don't know the precise uh, Etiology, but uh, treatment for the most part is safe, effective. I would probably treat, I'd err on the side of treatment most likely. Okay. Okay. Uh, and another question about the alkyl nitrates, like the, the popper. So, yeah. uh, we have seen several papers that publish this uh, new situation. Uh, here in Argentina, I don't know, in, in Colombia, I think so, it's the same, but in right. the States and in Europe are, are more frequently used. So, the, normally, they describe a disruption of the ellipsoid zone, as we know, but uh, do you have any experience about, about these drugs? Yeah, it's a, it's a recreational party drug. Um, yeah. And it, uh, the changes are really quite unique uh, in the macular region. Um, the, the only, there's no treatment per se, it's just a matter of uh, asking the patient the pertinent questions in terms of encounter to recreational drugs. Now, obviously, if they are taking the medication, uh, get them off of it because uh, there's not a lot of follow-up per se, but you have to presume that there's potential for worsening. Uh, but we have seen probably oh, just a handful, three or four cases here in Chicago, even though Chicago can be a you know, pretty big party town. Um, but uh, it's, it's fairly infrequent, at least uh, the toxicity case that we've seen. And, and this toxicity uh, improves with time, stopping the, 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 the drug abuse, or do, do you think that it's chronic? You know, I can't really answer that question. Most times patients taking recreational drugs are not the most reliable. And I really don't have much follow-up in that realm of patients. I mean, I, I can't even tell you report-wise if there's worsening, so I, I, I don't have the answer. Okay. Francisco, yeah, or, or Olite, que está conectado. Uh, the other question regarding the, uh, the use of fingolimod, uh, how often do you see this uh, toxicity in, in patients with multiple sclerosis and how do you treat them? Um, the case we've seen, you're talking about some macular edema, I presume? Yes. Yeah. Uh, once again, I'll talk to the neurologist. I'll, if the medication is something that they need to be on, uh, for the most part, the patients that we've seen, it's, 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 it doesn't go away spontaneously. We treat them anti-VEGF therapy. And the responses have been, for the most part, quite good. I've only seen probably less than 10 patients with that. Yeah, we don't see them quite often. No, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. Pretty rare. It's not the most common medication for multiple sclerosis, at least here in the States. So far. Okay. 
Ya. Lil, what about the Sirella Phil? So then, Phil? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the um, reports, of course, uh, of this issue of possible non arterial ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, if you look at aged match controls, the bottom line is that there's no convincing proof that it truly is a problem. Um, you look at some of the studies done with various forms of hereditary retinal degenerations, or maybe a worsening with certain types of retinal dyspigmentosa. Uh, what we see more commonly here in the States are people doing combination drug exposure. Uh, and once again, you got to really drill down for the history they're, they're doing. Agra with uh, oh, uh, uh, stimulant type medications. And we've seen some cases of central serous choroidopathy that have been really hard to explain, but it's a combination of uh, a number of agents that can lead to this. And so um, once again, I think in general, it's a pretty safe medication. And then I didn't, I didn't include that in my talk here, but I certainly have you know, a, a talk on that as well. And it's dose, dose related, dose dependent, but for the most part, it's really quite safe. I'll see it more commonly in younger people who are doing combination type uh, recreational drugs. And uh, 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 what about the combination of the tamoxifen in age macular degeneration patients? Well, once again, uh, the, I haven't really seen or I'm not really aware of that tamoxifen will exacerbate AMD per se. But the combination of hydroxychloroquine and tamoxifen certainly has a worsened prognosis. Yeah. What about that per se? I don't really know the mechanism of why that happens, but uh, a couple of studies have shown a distinct correlation. But does tamoxifen worsen age-related MAC generation? I don't have an answer, but I don't think the answer is yes. I just, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Francisco, no more question? No, no more questions. Uh, bueno, just... a ver si tenemos una... una... ¿Alguna pregunta del, del panel? Del chat, no, no hay ninguna. Ah, sí, hay dos. Uh... Pero decíla, decíla vos. Uh, ah, the, the, the use for the pre-work drinks for the gym. Is that related to the CSM and how it's treated in this case? Con el, nitrous nitrous oxide. oxide. Yes. Yeah, I don't have an answer. I'm not sure. Okay. I really don't know. What, what's been your experience? No. No, we don't have no experience. No experience at all. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Like, that said, might be. That I, might be I, 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 I think that the, 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 the doctor that asked has experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, you know, check, check out iDrug Registry and see if anybody yeah. talked about that because I'm just not aware of a, uh, a concern per se. Yeah. No, me neither. And do you have we have the, the, the last question before you have try you are tired it's, it's very late there uh, do you have an experience about penicillin in intramuscular that goes in in, in the artery circulation straight to to make a, a a situation similar to an artery occlusion in the retina do you have an experience about that no, injecting what type of agents? Yes, penicillin. Penicillin. Penicillin for syphilis. Oh. Penicillin. Um, yes. The answer is no. I, I have not seen that per se. Like you're talking about an intramuscular injection? Yeah. 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 So, I, I have yes. not even read about that. So I'm not aware of that. All I know is that, uh, you know, Chicago is number three United States for cases of syphilis. We see a fair amount. Yeah. Um, and the patients uh, usually do so incredibly well with intravenous medication that they yeah. are incredibly happy. But I just, I've, I've not seen any problem with an intramuscular complication per se, but I can't say that I've seen a patient treated intramuscularly for quite yes. some And what's, what's your opinion? I came in a pregunta de, de Marcelo también. What's uh, your opinion about the brolucizumab and the vasculitis and the inflammation? What, what yeah, do you I think, think it happens? Well, I think it's got to be some uh, manufacturing contaminant of some sort. Uh, okay, okay. Because it makes no sense otherwise. If you kind of go back also and you look at this issue that happened with vancomycin intracamerally, was it some kind of a toxic anterior segment syndrome, some contaminant? Because we just don't see it anymore. There was a cluster, you know, maybe we probably saw 
or had referred in six or seven patients, but this is all about five or six years ago now, just hasn't happened. Um, a task force was set up uh, by Novartis, the producers of Brolicizumab to investigate. I'm not aware of what, what's been found, if anything, but I'm hoping it was just a fluke short-term problem, but I think it almost has to be some type of a contaminant. Okay. Devastating. Do you think it's is the excipient, no, not the drug incident? No, I, don't, I, I mean, yeah. I don't think it's the drug. I mean, there, there's been, no, no, no. I can't say how many thousand injections have occurred in the States. There's been a lot. Yeah. But it, it's a small percentage of problems, but still, even if it's a, a, a one in a thousand, that's too much. But it, it just, it's something that I haven't heard of in the last couple of months uh, happening. So it, I think it was just some contaminant that happened, but uh, there's been no official release of information as to if a source has been identified. Okay. Uh, the, the, the last question, Bill, uh, how often would you recommend screening for patients being treated with chemotherapeutic agents? How often? Um, it's a tough one because it really depends upon the agent. Um, yeah. Checkpoint inhibitors, we probably recommend seeing them every on a quarterly basis every three or four months. Um, and of course, any, anytime they have new symptoms. Um, but probably in that, you know, three or four month time frame, even if they're doing well, because occasionally you'll see some features that look like central serous choroidopathy and the patient's doing quite well. But if you can head that off early before it gets worse, that can be beneficial. Um, but, but once again, there's, there's no set answer per se, really, but somewhere in the between three, four, even six month time frame. Okay. Okay. Francisco. Right. Okay. Sí. Well, Bill. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Always outstanding. My pleasure. Hope to see you I always enjoy. down in Columbia again sometime for the, for the real deal. So, but of I, I appreciate it. Thank you. You are always welcome. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and, uh, Muchas Andres, gracias, Francisco, por tu, Andres, por tu invitación. Eh? A ti por la moderación muy buena. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. A todos. Muchas gracias por su participación. A nombre de ACOREF y la Fundación Optomática Nacional, agradecemos su presencia en, en este webinar. En ocho días tendremos eh, otro que ambiciaremos también con tiempo. Muy interesante como esta presentación de hoy. Bill, have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Muchas gracias. And be safe. Have a nice bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye Francisco. Bye, y a todos los participantes. Gracias. A ti, gracias. Un abrazo. Un abrazo, Andrés.